everyone, it's Katrina. It's time to check out some of the most shocking archaeological discoveries. Let's go! Alexander's Colossal Bath Near the end of the 18th century, when Catherine the Great ruled Russia, the fabulous Babalovo Palace was built outside St. Petersburg. Today, the palace is in ruins, filled with old secrets of the Russian aristocracy. One of the weirder things discovered in the palace is a humongous granite bath. It's a bathtub worthy of an emperor or an empress. Archaeologists call it the Tsar Bath, yet nobody's really sure what the point of it was. Babylovo Palace is in a weird position, not far from two other palaces that are considerably more epic, the Catherine Palace and the Alexander Palace. Both were used as imperial residences during the Russian Empire. The origin story behind Babalovo Palace is shrouded in mystery. It was likely built as a temporary wooden palace in the early 1700s, perhaps as a rendezvous for secret lovers. Then, in 1782, the wooden palace was replaced with a stone palace. It served as a summer house, a place where Catherine could go to relax during the hot Russian months. It was built with seven rooms, each one opening to the beautiful park and gardens that surround the building. Then it was abandoned in 1791. Nobody used it for several decades until, in the 1820s, Tsar Alexander I had the palace renovated. Alexander was the grandson of Catherine. He supposedly loved the humble stone palace so much that he used it as his lover's paradise while having an affair with Sofia Velo, the daughter of a banker. It was in the 1820s when Alexander added the colossal bathtub. The bathtub is bigger than you can even imagine. The single piece of granite from which it was carved weighed over 160 tons. It supposedly took 10 years to finish, but it was totally worth it. The bath required 8,000 buckets of water to fill, which seems ridiculous. How did they even keep the water warm? Scientists think the bathtub was likely completed then the walls and ceilings were constructed around it. In World War II, when the Nazis invaded Russia, they tried to steal the bathtub. But it was too heavy, so they left it in the ruins of the palace. Its existence is still baffling. The Fogara North Africa is a hot and dry place with arid soil. It doesn't seem like the kind of place where ancient civilizations would settle down and start growing crops. But they did and it was all thanks to the invention of irrigation. In Algeria, there are a handful of surviving irrigation canals once used to make the Sahara Desert a fertile and flourishing place. As far as scientists understand it, the first people who harnessed the power of groundwater outside of Asia were the ancient Persians. When the armies of Persia expanded into Africa, they brought their ingenious inventions with them. Ancient canals can be found throughout Iran and in places like Spain and Morocco. In Algeria, these ancient waterworks are known as Fogara. The very first Fogara was built in Algeria around the 11th century. Arab Berber tribes from southern Morocco brought the technology into Algeria, a technology that is still used today. There are an estimated 930 operating in Algeria alone, some of which have been continuously moving water for centuries. The majority of Fogaras can be found around various oases, near the areas of Adrar and Gurara. In total, there are over 1,000 miles of underground pipelines transporting water from underground aquifers to dry lowland areas. The way these ancient marvels work is really simple. Water is brought to a specific place through a series of sloping pipelines. You can tell the end of the Fogara from its comb-like Casria where the water bubbles to the surface and is divided into various gutters and ditches. The water then flows to where it needs to be. Many of the old Fogaras have been destroyed or abandoned, or replaced by modern water pumps, but there are many that are still active. After nearly a thousand years, some people in Algeria's oases are still reliant on this ancient technology. Genghis Khan and the Black Death August 18, 1227, was the day one of the greatest rulers in history died. The founder of the Mongol Empire, the Khan of Khans, passed on through to the other side. Stories have circulated for centuries as to how Genghis Khan really died. He supposedly fell from his horse. One story says he was stabbed by a princess. Marco Polo said Genghis Khan died after an arrow hit him in the knee and then the wound got infected. 
Another story claims that Genghis Khan died while fighting an epic battle against the forces of China. But how did it really happen? According to a new study from Italian and Australian researchers, Genghis Khan caught the Black Death, aka the bubonic plague. If there's one plague you don't want to catch, it's the bubonic one. But how could researchers possibly know how the Khan died without studying his body? If you don't already know, the tomb of Genghis Khan has never been found. The men who built his tomb supposedly ran a thousand horses over the ground to erase any evidence of it, then were killed so they couldn't tell anyone. The researchers have cited two pieces of evidence as proof of their theory. The first piece of evidence is a report from Chinese official Yelu Chukai. Yelu was one of the advisors to Genghis Khan, a doctor in the Mongol army who treated thousands of troops. His report claims that the forces of Genghis were suffering from bubonic plague. Yelu wrote of his medical treatments and how he used rhubarb to try and heal those who were sick. This seems to be proof that the Mongols were dying in mass numbers from the Black Death. The second piece of evidence is a report from the history of Yuan. It was written that the Khan suffered from a fever that lasted about a week. The plague typically lasted around eight days before claiming its victim. There is another report from Persian historian Atamalek Juvaini that says the ruler of the Mongols was overcome by an incurable disease. Some think the incurable disease was typhoid fever, but the Khan wasn't reported vomiting or experiencing abdominal pain. The consensus seems to be that in the 13th century, people knew the Khan died from the plague. But these days, only a few sources remain that detail his death. And they're pretty vague. And now for number 12, but first, it's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to Stefan Medvek and Deborah Dillahant for supporting this channel. We wouldn't be here without you guys. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Multiple Sclerosis In a bizarre new discovery, scientists have found the unexpected origin of multiple sclerosis. Ancient DNA has shown that livestock farmers from thousands of years ago are the ones responsible for modern people suffering from MS. MS, or multiple sclerosis, is a crippling autoimmune disease that affects an estimated 2.8 million people across the globe. The disease impacts the brain and spinal cord, with roughly a third of all cases being in the United States of America. It's a disease most prevalent among people of Northern European descent. An international team of researchers wanted to learn why Northern Europeans are so much more likely to have multiple sclerosis. When they began poking through ancient DNA strands and looking into genetic variants, they found a commonality. Multiple sclerosis came onto the scene about 5,000 years ago. The rise of the disease coincided with the rise of sheep and cattle herders in Europe, I can get a little more specific than that, though. A migration of people out of Central Asia and into the region of Ukraine and Russia were the first sufferers of multiple sclerosis. As they continued migrating into Northwestern Europe, they brought certain gene variants that increased the risk of MS. These genetic variants persist to this day. More than that, they seem to be getting worse. Scientists have found that the prevalence of autoimmune diseases has been rising alarmingly for the past five decades. The big question is why? Why did a group of people from the Eurasian steppe suddenly become victims of autoimmune diseases when they migrated into Europe? Scientists think it could have been lifestyle changes. However, they don't really know. Their discovery of MS's origin has only led to more questions. Digging for potatoes in 1952, a Scottish schoolboy got into some trouble. I don't know exactly what he was doing to get in trouble, but his punishment was that he got sent into the garden to dig up some potatoes. As the young boy was digging for the delicious taters, he found something truly shocking. I mean, shocking enough that it's hard to imagine the young boy's excitement at that moment. He uncovered a statue that was made in Egypt 4,000 years ago. How did an ancient Egyptian statue end up in the Scottish boy's garden? 14 years after the discovery, there was another discovery. And then, several years after that, in 1984, a group of treasure hunters with a metal detector found yet another item. To this day, 18 pieces of treasure have been dug up at the historic location in Fife, known as Melville House. 
It's an astounding mystery because scientists still don't know how the treasures got there. Were they brought by an Egyptian expedition to Scotland? It's an exciting concept, but most likely not accurate. A more realistic answer to the question is that Alexander Lessie Melville traveled to Egypt in 1856 and returned to Scotland with relics he had procured. The year after he returned to Scotland, he died. It's highly likely that in the chaos after his death, the relics were forgotten. Then, when the original outbuilding was demolished, the relics got lost in the rubble and eventually buried by accumulated soil. Even if the Egyptians didn't visit Scotland, the Melville House treasure hoard is still an awesome discovery. Imagine being punished to work in the garden as a youngster only to find a priceless piece of Egyptian history. You'd almost have no choice but to follow a career in archaeology after that. Khufu's ship It took many years of work, but in 2021, scientists announced they had finally completed exhuming all the artifacts from the second Khufu ship discovered buried next to the Great Pyramid of Giza. This ship is one of the most remarkable artifacts anywhere in the world. If you've never heard of the Khufu ships before, let me explain. These were ancient wooden boats buried in deep pits next to Pharaoh Khufu's epic pyramid. Archaeologists believe they were used as part of the funeral ritual upon the pharaoh's death. As for their purpose, the ships were likely designed to help Khufu reach his eternal reward in the afterlife. The Egyptians believe that Khufu would be able to ride his wooden boats to their version of heaven. The discovery of the boats is not new. In 1954, engineer Kamal el Malak uncovered two pits next to the pyramid. These boats had remained unseen by human eyes for almost 5,000 years. The boats are still considered some of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. One of the boats was significantly bigger. The main boat is an astounding 143 feet long and almost 20 feet wide. Archaeologists consider it a masterpiece of ancient craftsmanship. It's one of the oldest and biggest boats ever found from ancient times. This was an impressive vessel made thousands of years before the Vikings started sailing to distant lands. To make it even more remarkable, the Egyptians didn't use a single nail to build them. They employed a system of ropes and clever techniques. Even though the boats were found over 50 years ago, it wasn't until recently that archaeological experts were able to properly excavate the second ship's burial pit. They uncovered 1,700 wooden pieces, along with tons of metal hooks. Finding metal hooks was very exciting because it proves that ancient Egyptians had sophisticated technology. According to the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, this is the earliest known example of an Egyptian boat built using metal pieces. The Gauntlet Archaeologists in Switzerland started this year off with a bang when they announced the discovery of a medieval gauntlet. During excavations at the legendary Kyberg Castle, researchers found one of the best preserved metal fists ever from the Middle Ages. Kyberg Castle is one of the most impressive and imposing medieval fortresses in Switzerland. Archaeologists were digging next to the castle when they came across a weaving cellar. This was a place where people wove fabrics in the 14th century up until it was burned in a fire. Researchers also found traces of a forge and some metal scrap. They uncovered things like hammers and tweezers and other implements used in the creation of medieval armaments. Then they found the completely preserved gauntlet. This thing is awesome! It was a metal glove worn on the right hand, with small iron plates linked using rivets. The metal rivets were fixed to a leather base which was stitched onto fabric. According to the press release, this could be the oldest intact gauntlet ever found. Even in the best European museums, there isn't a gauntlet as old or as well-preserved as this one. Do you think you could walk around sporting a single metal gauntlet like a medieval Michael Jackson? Let me know in the comments! The Golden Bust of Marcus Aurelius In April 1939, one of the greatest statues ever found was discovered during the excavation of a sewer. One of the excavation workers hit a hard object with their pickaxe. The object was a gold bust of ancient Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius. The bust had somehow gotten lodged in the sewer pipe. It was covered in silt and earth and caked with limestone. 
This wasn't just a remarkable discovery because it was the bust of a famous emperor. It was also an incredible discovery because, at the time, the bust was the largest solid piece of gold ever found in Switzerland. This giant chunk of gold weighed three and a half pounds and was insanely valuable. It was first exhibited to the public right after its discovery, but soon got moved to a bank vault to prevent a potential theft. Visitors traveled to the bank from all across Europe just to see it. Copies were made and are still traveling around the world to various museums right now. What was the bust doing in a sewer pipe? To understand how it got there, you first need to understand the history of the region. The bust was discovered in the territory of Aventicum. 2,000 years ago during the Roman Empire, Rome had a colony here of about 20,000 people. There was a temple, a theater, a larger amphitheater, and multiple bathhouses. Archaeologists have discovered other ancient structures as well, like Emperor Trajan's sanctuary. The bus purpose is unknown. Experts think it may have been stuck on a pole and displayed somewhere in honor of Marcus Aurelius. Marcus himself was emperor between 161 and 180 AD. He was famous for his love of philosophy and for being the last ruler in the era of the five good emperors. His death coincided with the end of peace and stability in the empire, a peace which had lasted 200 years. What followed Marcus's demise was war, chaos, and the fall of the empire. The Mummies of Peru At the ancient site of Pachacamac in Peru, Archaeologists recently uncovered 73 intact burials. Scientists from the University of Warsaw were flabbergasted when they came across the tombs totally untouched by time or grave robbers. The ancient mummies could help scientists decode the secrets of the mighty Wadi Empire. The Wadi Empire appeared in the coastal areas of ancient Peru over 1,500 years ago. They built a shining city as their capital called Wadi and had numerous other settlements. They were exceptionally good at exploiting the landscape to feed their growing population. They had a sophisticated system of government to control their provincial capitals. And don't forget about the roads. The development of roads across Peru allowed the Wadi to maintain an unbreakable empire for 550 years. They lasted longer than the Roman Empire. Yet for all their success, few know about the Wadi today. The Inca civilization is far more popular, even though the Wadi came first and heavily influenced the Inca. One thing the Inca had in common with their predecessors was a hunger for war. Although the Wadi built great cities and mastered irrigation, they flexed intense military might. At the end of the 6th century AD, when the Nazca and Moche civilizations vanished following a 30-year drought, the Wadi survived, and they thrived. How they declined around the year 1000 is still unknown to this day. I better get back to the discovery of the 73 burials. Archaeologists found bundles inside the preserved tombs known as fardos. These were essentially bundles of mummies and their grave goods. Each mummy was given a creepy false head or a mask as part of the burial ritual. Researcher Christoph Makowski said the masks were part of the family's attempt to ensure the deceased person lived on after their physical death. The Wadi believed that each year, the dead returned to take care of the harvest. If the dead weren't given proper burials, they wouldn't bring rain to grow crops. Activating Stonehenge in 1100 AD, Geoffrey of Monmouth made an outrageous claim. He said England's most famous stone monument, the legendary Stonehenge, was built by the wizard Merlin. This was the same guy who came up with the story of King Arthur. You can see why modern scholars don't think King Arthur or his trusted wizard was real. But if Merlin didn't build Stonehenge, who did? In 1640, famous philosopher John Aubrey put forth the idea that it was the Druids who constructed Stonehenge. Fifteen years later, the architect John Webb said Stonehenge was built by the Romans during their occupation of Britain. It was designed as a Roman temple for worship of the sky god, Calus. There have been a lot of theories over the centuries, and even today, scientists don't truly know. The general agreement right now among experts 
is that Neolithic humans built Stonehenge 5,100 years ago. Well, that was when they started building it. It wasn't finished until 2500 BC. Then, around 1520 BC, Stonehenge was abandoned. The dating of the monument has been confirmed through technology, but the purpose of the henge is still a mystery. In the 1960s, Gerald Stanley Hawkins claimed it was used as a calculator to predict lunar eclipses. His opinion was that farmers who migrated to England from mainland Europe built Stonehenge as a lunar observatory. Every year on June 21st, thousands of people flock to Stonehenge to watch the sunrise on the summer solstice. But according to Professor Clive Ruggles, a leading authority on Stonehenge, this isn't right. Stonehenge was designed to hold ceremonies on the sunset of the winter solstice, not on the sunrise of the summer solstice. The English professor even has evidence to back up his claim. Stonehenge is more than just a circle of stones. There is also a ceremonial approach leading to the monument. The avenue leading to the stones is aligned with the descent of the sun on the winter solstice. The stones facing the avenue were intricately carved, whereas their backsides were left bare. Ruggles said it only makes sense that pilgrims journeyed here once a year to witness the final rays of the setting sun as they spilled through the stones. It marked the end of winter and the birth of the new year. Have you ever visited Stonehenge on either of the solstices? If so, let me know what your experience was like. The Tomb of Jesus For people in the Western world, especially in Europe, it's popular to take a break between studies to travel around India on a spiritual journey. But was the first one to go on a spiritual walkabout to India, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago? There is a shrine in India that supposedly belongs to Jesus. The Christian Messiah's physical body is said to have been buried here. The Rosa Bal Shrine can be found in Kashmir, and oh, let me tell you, it is full of controversy. In the ancient Persian language, Rosa means holy, and in the Kashmiri language, Bal means shrine. Put the words together and you have holy shrine. Some think the shrine houses the grave of the prophet Yusasaf. Others think it's the grave of Jesus. But who is right? The shrine was not a particularly important place until 1899. That was when the eccentric founder of the Ahmadiyya movement claimed Rosa Bal was the final resting place of Jesus. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad claimed Jesus survived the crucifixion in Israel and fled to the Indian subcontinent. There, he found peace and tranquility in the Valley of Kashmir. Jesus lived a long and healthy life, passing on at the age of 120. This story is basically heresy to Christians. The Holy Bible teaches that Jesus was crucified at the age of 33 and buried in a garden outside Jerusalem. The Quran says the same thing. Both holy books claim that on the third day after his death, Jesus ascended to heaven. So what made Mirza Ghulam Ahmad believe that Jesus ran away to India? Inside the shrine is a rock carving of a pair of feet with crucifixion wounds. Presumably, whoever died here had suffered crucifixion. Mirza also believed the prophet Yusasaf may have secretly been Jesus Christ. There are some other bizarre claims to back up the theory. For example, the people of Kashmir are thought to be descendants of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They settled in India after they were driven from Israel around 700 BC by the Assyrians. Even today, many tribes in Kashmir call themselves Benai Israel, or the children of Israel in English. But what about the history of the shrine itself? Surely there are documents detailing who was originally buried where the shrine stands, right? The site was first recorded in 112 AD, but there is almost no information about it. It's believed the shrine was built on top of a cave or somebody's burial plot, either Jesus or a prophet. These days, the shrine stands across from a Muslim cemetery. Who do you think was buried here? Could Jesus have really lived out the rest of his life in India? What are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments. Amazing Pompeii You can dig anywhere in the ancient ruins of Pompeii and find treasure. The Roman city was destroyed just shy of 2,000 years ago when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD. To date, only around one-third of the city has been excavated. 
more than half of Pompeii is still waiting to be explored. According to archaeologist Alessandro Russo, who was involved in a recent expedition, Pompeii will continue to be excavated by future generations. Right now, scientists are focusing on small pieces of the city, one block at a time. They want to preserve what has already been uncovered. In the most recent work, archaeologists found human skeletons, a kitchen shrine decorated with snakes, and a bakery. Imagine heading to the Pompeii Bakery first thing in the morning for Roman cupcakes and a flash of espresso. The new dig site represents a single city block, roughly 32,000 square feet. Archaeologists uncovered a giant oven in a commercial bakery that was able to bake 100 loaves of bread per day. It is one of about 50 bakeries that have already been found in Pompeii. What in the world do they need so many bakeries for? This one didn't even have a storefront. Archaeologists think it was most likely a wholesaler, baking bread and then selling it to the various bakeries and fast food restaurants around town. The city block was packed with good stuff. Just a few feet away from where the oven was discovered, experts identified a kitchen shrine likely used to venerate one of the Roman gods. It was decorated in expertly carved reliefs of serpents. This may have been part of the bakery. Archaeologists also identified a piece of immortalized drama. Well, a few pieces. They uncovered a trio of skeletons that appeared to have been hiding under a staircase when they died. Maybe they were workers at the bakery who desperately shielded themselves from the eruption, only to be roasted. On the opposite side of the bakery's atrium, archaeologists found a bedroom. Inside the bedroom was a charred mass that was once a bed. Archaeologists know this because of its obvious location and the rough outline of it. The bed was burned, but not by the volcano. They think a lamp was knocked over by somebody trying to escape, and the bed was ignited. The same people whose skeletons were found under the staircase may have been responsible for knocking over the lamp and burning the bed. These amazing discoveries come from one small area in the city. It goes to show just how many tiny stories are waiting to be told throughout Pompeii. Hungry for seaweed How do you feel about eating seaweed? Depending on where you're from in the world, eating seaweed from the beach might sound about as appetizing as eating bugs, unless of course you like sushi. And I know dried seaweed snacks are becoming popular. But if you lived 8,400 years ago, seaweed might have been a major part of your diet. And if you live in East Asia, of course, it's still a part of your diet. Seaweed is a staple in East Asian kitchens, but not so much in Europe. Not since around the 12th century. To understand the relationship between Europeans and seaweed, scientists took a look at the dental remains from 74 individuals. The remains came from 28 archaeological sites spanning a massive amount of time, from between 6400 BC and 1100 AD. The sites were spread out between Scotland and Spain. Scientists used mass spectrometry to look at biomarkers for aquatic plants. This amazing technology can look at old teeth and identify what they were chewing. An astounding 70% of the samples showed the ingestion of three different kinds of seaweeds, red, green, and brown, plus other aquatic plants like sea kale, for example. The research proved that ancient people across Europe ate seaweed for thousands of years. Karen Hardy from the University of Glasgow said aquatic plants were likely forged as a nutritional supplement comparable to mushrooms. But then, why did Europeans stop eating seaweed? At some point over the last 800 years, seaweed fell out of favor. Do you like eating seaweed? Let me know in the comments! Lost Records Jenny Metcalf is a biomedical Egyptologist at the University of Manchester. She was looking through documents from the early 20th century when she came across a series of recording cards. The cards are from one of the first excavations conducted in Lower Nubia. The documents, thought to be lost in World War II, have taken the scientific community by storm. Nubia was the ancient realm under Egypt. It was centered around the Nile Valley, just like Egypt, only it was in the south, in the area that is now Sudan. The region was inhabited by the Nubian people for thousands of years. Some experts even think the Nubians came before the Egyptians, making them one of the earliest civilizations in Africa. Throughout the years, many kingdoms rose and fell in Nubia. 
The most famous is the Kushite Empire. They arrived on the scene about 3,000 years ago, influenced by both the Egyptians and the cultures that came before them. At the time, Egypt was in a state of disarray. The Egyptians didn't have the means to control their southern neighbors. This allowed the Kushites to flourish. They established the mighty capital city of Napata and seized power. As Egypt floundered, the Kushite kings dominated the political landscape. They spread into the lands of Egypt, reaching the great city of Thebes and conquering it. Kushite control over Egypt lasted until the Assyrians invaded in 666 BC. To make an extraordinarily long story short, the Assyrians messed everything up for the Nubians. In 590 BC, after the Assyrians had left, Egyptian pharaoh Sametichus II sacked Napata and the Kushites were shattered. They retreated to the city of Meroe, only to have Meroe invaded by the Aksumites and destroyed. The people of Kush were lost. Let's get back to Jenny and the mysterious document she found. In the early 1900s, a team of scientists spent four years excavating lower Nubian cemeteries. They uncovered over 20,000 graves and a staggering number of artifacts. The oldest graves were from about 5,800 years ago, over 1,000 years before the Great Pyramid of Giza was built. What was discovered had been recorded by researchers on recording cards, but the cards again were thought destroyed by a bomb during World War II. Now, Jenny has uncovered 495 of the recording cards, previously thought lost forever. The cards detail amazing secrets from 20 different cemeteries. An analysis of the cards could shed light on what life was like for Nubians in ancient times. There is a huge amount of information to go through, but it's historically critical. Nubia has been largely ignored by archaeologists despite the fact its history stretches as far back as 8000 BC, long before ancient Egypt. Prehistoric Saudi Arabia There is no place on Earth that looks as unappealing as the Saudi Arabian desert. I don't mean unappealing as in ugly, because it's not. I mean unappealing as in how could anyone possibly live here? It's a barren desert without an ounce of moisture to go around. In the Harat Kaibar volcanic field, it's particularly inhospitable. The landscape is literally volcanic. Yet people did live here, and they lived here for a very long time. Archaeologists recently completed four years of research in the volcanic field. They didn't just find a few structures. The scientists found tens of thousands of ancient structures. They are between 4,000 and 7,000 years old. The lost ruins prove an advanced society of humans dominated the Arabian Peninsula even though it's so hostile. Who were these desert dwellers and where did they go? It's a question Dr. Hugh Thomas has struggled with for the past few years since finding proof of them in the desert. Dr. Thomas says most archaeological research has been focused on what's known as the Fertile Crescent. This is the area in Jordan, Israel, and Syria that was far more hospitable to human life. But clearly, human life also existed elsewhere. The main theory is that the Harat Kabar volcanic field was significantly greener 4,000 years ago. The climate probably changed, forcing humans to go to more hospitable zones. Scientists don't really know what happened. The rise and fall of Saudi's desert kingdom is still a mystery. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. The Lost City of Colombia. Ciudad Perdida, the lost city of Colombia, is more ancient and arguably more mysterious than Machu Picchu in Peru, yet not many people have heard of it. Ciudad Perdida is hidden deep inside the jungle of the Sierra Nevada. This is an area of tall mountains, dense forests, and history dating back thousands of years. The lost city was originally founded by the mighty Tairona people who ruled the region of Colombia's Caribbean coast. They are remembered for their architectural marvels, advanced engineering knowledge, and elaborate gold objects they left behind. The Tairona had total control of the region up until the Spanish invasion. While both Ciudad Perdida and Machu Picchu were both hidden way up in the mountains, Ciudad Perdida is 600 years older than Machu Picchu. It's also much harder to reach, and there are no trains or tourist buses. The only way to reach this strange place is by traveling up the coast to Santa Marta and then making your perilous journey into the bush. Ciudad Perdida was also discovered fairly recently, in the 1970s, 
But the location is complicated. As recently as 2003, a group of tourists were kidnapped while on their way to this lost city in the jungle. They were held hostage for 100 days, making this place hard to get to and risky for explorers. But if you do ever make the trek, you would be in for a great adventure. A well from the Stone Age. In the Czech Republic, archaeologists came across an ancient well that they believe to be the oldest wooden structure in the world. It was discovered in East Bohemia, near the small town of Ostrov. While construction of a new highway was underway near the town, they came across the wooden timbers of the well, and archaeologists were called in to investigate. Excavations revealed a small wooden box that once lined the walls of the well. It was not that large, only about two and a half by two and a half feet but it was an authentic wooden structure from the Stone Age. The reason it's so shocking is that it came from the Neolithic period, sometime around the year 5255 BC. That's over 7,000 years ago, confirmed using dendrochronological dating techniques and measuring rings in the wooden planks. Were there older wooden structures in the world? In all likelihood, yes. But wood doesn't survive very well, which is why most archaeological evidence comes in the form of stone and metal. This is the oldest wooden structure that's been found in Europe, and it can be traced back to a time when farming was a new invention. The well is critical to showing exactly when farmers first came around, because that's the only reason a well would have been needed. 7,000 years ago, somebody dug a hole in the ground, figured out how to bring water out of it, and settled their very own farm. For all we know, this small chunk of land in East Bohemia could have been one of the first farms in the world. Would you rather be a farmer or a hunter if you lived during the Stone Age? Let me know in the comments. The Denmark Pyramid Archaeologists recently discovered evidence that Stone Age people built a megalithic labyrinth in Denmark. They've discovered a large enclosure near Stevens, but they can't figure out exactly what its purpose was. Professionals with the Museum Southeast Denmark were the ones to discover the palisade enclosures, a sort of fence framing of an oval area from the Neolithic period. Pernil Sloth, the leader of the excavation, said it was overwhelming when he and his team realized they were standing in the center of something enormous. When trying to figure out what they were dealing with, researchers looked to the few scraps of remaining fencing. The fence was constructed in five rows extending outwards, but the openings in each row of fencing are offset, and the design was likely on purpose. In other words, you couldn't simply walk straight through each row of fencing, you would have walked into one and then had to turn left or right and find the next entry into the second layer. Sounds kind of like a labyrinth if you ask me. And the researchers agree. It could be there was nothing here except a maze, a very primitive labyrinth built thousands of years ago for some unknown purpose. Even though researchers believe it could be a labyrinth, that's as far as their theory goes. The why and how are anyone's guess. What's your guess? Let me know in the comments below. Ancient Mask in Argentina In 2005, residents of a small Argentinian village came across human bones jutting out from the ground like the broken ribs of a ship. It was pretty terrifying, but the villagers couldn't help their curiosity. They started looking around and sifting through the dirt, and that was when they found an amazing copper mask. The mask was flat, a little curved on the inside, and had eye holes, a nose hole, and a mouth hole. It also happened to be 3,000 years old, making it one of the oldest metal objects to ever be found in South America. When you're dealing with the oldest of anything, there's bound to be some mystery and confusion. In this case, researchers say the mask could be evidence that a mysterious population in Argentina learned how to work metal before the pre-Inca cultures of Peru. Even though humans in Peru were fashioning things out of gold 4,000 years ago, copper wasn't used. At least, not until after this Argentinian mask was made. It's difficult to definitively say one culture did one thing first. Complex metalworking was born in Peru and Argentina right around the same time, although nobody can say which culture was the first to master it. Whatever the case, the mask is still exceptional. And to make it even more mysterious, the mask is over 1,000 years older than the place where it was found. Nobody knows how it got there, who made it, or what in the world it could have been used for. Any ideas? Ancient Tattoos A set of very tiny combs from the Polynesian Kingdom of Tonga could very well be the oldest tattoo kits in the world. The tools, itty-bitty combs made from human bone, 
were sitting in a storage facility at a university in Australia for decades before a team of researchers pulled them out for an investigation. They reassessed the artifacts and were able to date them as being 2,700 years old. Now, what you may not know is that tattooing goes back to the very beginning of human civilization. We have archaeological proof from ancient mummies discovered from Siberia to Egypt that people tattooed themselves. Even Otzi the Iceman, the famous frozen caveman discovered in the Alps 5,000 years ago, was found with dozens of tattoos. The people of Oceania also tattooed themselves, but because of the hot and wet climate of Polynesia, nobody's skin has survived from ancient times for archaeologists to see the evidence for themselves. But here's the thing. Since 2016, scientists have begun to find tools for tattooing. In the Solomon Islands, volcanic glass tools that may have been used for tattooing were found to be 3,000 years old. Turkey bones in the grave of a Native American in Tennessee were dated to be 3,600 years old and were found to be stained with ink. The point is that tattooing has been important in just about every culture across the planet. And while tattooing has been around since the Stone Age, these bone combs are the oldest complete tool sets ever found. Big thank you to Kyle Oliveros and Nikki Alegre. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, welcome, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and join us. The Falcon Emblem Anne Boleyn married King Henry VIII in the year 1533, triggering a series of events that changed the English monarchy forever. The marriage brought about what we call today the English Reformation, altering the history of the empire. After Henry's first wife, Queen Catherine of Aragon, died in 1536, Anne became queen. One month later, she had her third miscarriage, and later that year in May, she was arrested on charges of adultery and incest and then executed. She could not give the king a male heir, which ultimately got her killed. But it was her death that resulted in her daughter becoming Queen Elizabeth I in 1558 and ending England's Tudor dynasty. Queen Elizabeth marked the split between England and the Roman Church. It may seem like a small thing, but Anne Boleyn did change history. Just recently, historians came across one of Anne's emblems, a small white and gold bird holding a scepter and perched on a bouquet of roses. It was discovered underneath a thick layer of grime and black paint at Hampton Court Palace, sold at an auction for about $100 in 2019. It was thought to just be some ordinary decoration that had once been in the palace, but was later identified as Anne's very own 16th century badge. It was something that probably adorned her private apartment. It was likely removed and tossed in the trash after the king ordered her execution, only to be found over 500 years later. Its actual worth is 2,700 times more than what it auctioned for. What would you pay for this pendant? Let me know in the comments below. Secret Tunnel Under Pompeii Archaeologists found the remains of an ancient military horse entombed like a statue in the Italian city of Pompeii, buried and solidified in volcanic ash. But what's even more incredible is that the discovery was made by authorities who had been alerted to illegal excavations. Tomb raiders had been trying to pillage Pompeii and steal artifacts. They had dug their tunnel to get into the archaeological park. When authorities realized what was happening, they journeyed into the secret tunnel and followed it to a stable north of Pompeii, where they found the fossilized remains of a rich family's horse. The thieves had their base camp inside a villa on the outer edge of the Pompeii Archaeological Park in an area that researchers have been neglecting. It was only by following the trail of thieves that archaeologists found it. But what makes the villa so unique is that despite being covered in volcanic ash, it was occupied again some years after the eruption. It's the first sign archaeologists have that people return to Pompeii, or at least its fringes, and continue to live and farm. Why do you think people would return to Pompeii after such destruction? Let me know your guess in the comments. The Jaguar and the Starfish At the Templo Mayor in central Mexico City, part of what was once the great capital of Tenochtitlan, archaeologists with Mexico's National Institute of Archaeology and History made a fascinating discovery. They found evidence of an ancient Aztec ritual involving starfish and a jaguar. The archaeologists found about 160 starfish in total, hidden under a thin layer of soil inside an altar within the temple. At first, they thought the starfish were small white stones, but quickly realized the stones were bones. They all belonged to the same species, the chocolate chip starfish. 
and they were probably offerings for the two-sided god that represented fire and water and agriculture and war. Archaeologist Miguel Baez Perez believes these particular starfish were chosen as sacrifices because of their similarity to the jaguar. The pattern on the starfish looks quite similar to the pattern on a jaguar, and so the Aztecs may have seen some correlation between the two. They brought all those starfish into the depths of the temple along with a huge jaguar and killed them all in the name of their two-faced god right at the foot of the altar. Would you ever visit a site where sacrifices were performed? Or would it be too creepy? Let me know! Ancient Sacred Pool On the Phoenician island of Motia, just off the coast of Sicily, archaeologists have identified an ancient sacred pool that was once aligned perfectly with the stars and the sky. These days, Motia goes by the modern name of San Pantaleo Island, but around 2,500 years ago, it was a Phoenician port city that grew rich from maritime trade. During the first excavations in the 1920s, archaeologists misidentified an artificial basin as being a military harbor. It turns out the artificial basin was a pool constructed in 550 BC just after the city was attacked by Carthage. It was a centerpiece, the heart of an enormous religious sanctuary that has since been utterly destroyed. The pool, called the Sacred Pool of Cothon, was part of a huge temple dedicated to the old Mesopotamian god Baal. It even had an enormous statue erected on a platform right in the middle of the pool, depicting Baal himself. But it gets even better. As archaeologists excavated the site over the last 10 years, they found more and more evidence of cult activity. Temples, altars, evidence of offerings, pedestals with shattered statues, everything suggesting Motia was once the biggest cultic complex in the Mediterranean. This wasn't just a port city. It was a religious island of fanatical cult members who aligned their buildings with the stars. They constructed their temples to be filled with light during the solstices. And when they weren't trading or building, they spent their days worshipping Baal. Human Bone Amulet A mysterious bone amulet was recently excavated from a Bronze Age grave in Siberia. The grave was likely made by the Tagar culture, who lived on the Siberian steppe up until the Iron Age, between the 8th century and the 2nd century BC. These were some of the most proficient bronze smelters in all of Eurasia. They lived at the same time as the nomadic Scythians, who dominated the region north of the Black Sea, and were sandwiched between the Karasuk and Tashtik cultures. The end of the Bronze Age was a time of great change in Siberia and Central Asia, when cultures rose and fell as quickly as the winds changed. Only a few hundred Tagar burials have ever been found and recorded. They're usually filled with skeletons and bronze artifacts. The bone amulet is the only one of its kind ever uncovered from a Tagar grave. It was found inside an enclosure with four human bodies, the skull of a horse, a bronze mirror, pottery vessels, a random chunk of meat, and the carcasses of a calf and a sheep. The amulet itself was mostly made of bronze, with a human bone fragment in its center. It was also decorated with threaded tubular bronze and one very large tusk from a boar. It's one of a kind and nobody knows what it was used for. Archaeologists suspect it probably had some kind of magical purpose, meaning the woman buried with the amulet may have been some kind of sorceress. Sadly, the Tagar just didn't leave behind enough information for us to piece this one together. The Lost Golden City 300 miles south of Cairo on the banks of the Nile River, there lies the city of Luxor. Not far away is the legendary Valley of the Kings, the very place where archaeologists discovered the tomb of King Tut a century ago. But when they found the tomb of the young King Tut, archaeologists were a little confused because they couldn't find a mortuary temple that they believed should have been nearby, a place where priests and relatives of the ruler could leave their gifts and tributes. Recently, Egyptologist Zahi Hawass went looking for this lost mortuary temple. What he found instead was a lost golden city. His team started looking in the area around Luxor, where Tut's successors had their own mortuary temples built. That was when they stumbled upon the remains of an ancient metropolis. Just weeks after the dig started, they began uncovering mud bricks stamped with the name of Pharaoh Amenhotep III. This allowed the researchers to date the city to 3,400 years ago. They must have established it during the rule of Amenhotep III between 1391 and 1353 BC. Hawass named it the Golden City because it was founded during the Golden Age of Egypt, when the Egyptians were at their best. This was a time of great prosperity, 
fantastic military might, and relative peace inside the kingdom. Amenhotep III had one of the easiest rules of any Egyptian pharaoh. He wasn't at war once, and sat on the throne for 40 years while Egypt's economy grew larger and larger. The Mouth of Truth The Mouth of Truth is one of the more bizarre artifacts discovered in Italy which dates back to the days of the Romans. They used the Mouth of Truth as a lie detector test in the 1st century AD. Instead of hooking electrodes up to keep watch on someone's vitals, they invited them to stick their hand into the Mouth of Truth. If a person stuck their hand between the jaws of this stone head, they had no choice but to speak the truth. If they lied, they believed the mouth would bite off their hand. It was a pretty good scare tactic, especially because the enormous head looks like it wouldn't mind biting off a couple of hands. But nobody knows where this bizarre thing came from. It's a tall stone disc carved with an angry human face in its center, with hollow, lifeless eyes and a huge, gaping mouth. It looks like an oversized medallion or a giant evil coin. And even though they used it as a lie detector in the Middle Ages in actual court proceedings, some say the original purpose of the Mouth of Truth wasn't as exciting. It may have been a well cover, a piece of decoration for a fountain, the lid for an access hole, or the face of a pagan god. The truth was lost ages ago. The people who used it at trials in the Middle Ages probably didn't even know what it was originally used for. The Oldest Shipwreck Archaeologists have discovered what they think could be the oldest intact shipwreck in the entire world. They found this mysterious shipwreck sitting at the bottom of the Black Sea, right off the coast of Bulgaria. It's over 60 feet long and was likely sitting undisturbed for 2,400 years, at a depth of over 6,000 feet. Yet despite its age, the ship is in fabulous condition. Its mast, rudders, and even its rowing benches are still complete, as if the sea had never damaged them. The entire ship looks like it floated gently to the bottom of the sea and then sat there without decaying. This is actually possible because of the low levels of oxygen in the Black Sea as compared to other bodies of water where ancient ships sailed, like the Mediterranean. The ship was likely Greek, as it looks quite similar to the ships painted on Greek wine vases 2,000 years ago. Professor John Adams from Black Sea Maritime Archaeology says such an amazing discovery could change our understanding of shipbuilding in the ancient world. Bringing it all the way back to the surface to study is going to be a hard task. They've only been able to take small pieces of it away for testing at one time. We still don't know who it belonged to, or even what it was doing in the Black Sea, or how it sunk. Prehistoric Children's Art A new study has revealed that 25% of prehistoric rock art around the world could be nothing but children's doodles. What archaeologists thought of as the complex paintings of adult artists could have just been kids messing around with pigments. The study analyzed 750 hand stencils from across Western Europe, including countries like Spain and France. Throughout the study, researchers saw that at least 25% of all the paintings were made by children, either young kids or even infants. According to Diego Garate with the Cantabria International Institute of Prehistoric Research, the point of the study was to get a better look at the motivators behind the artwork. This means researchers wanted to know not what the art represents, but why it was being made in the first place, and by who. Learning that kids did so much of the artwork kind of turns the world of prehistoric rock art on its head. Before the study, scientists agreed worldwide that prehistoric men were the only ones who created art in caves. There's been a kind of mythical status surrounding a lot of rock paintings, with anthropologists dissecting them endlessly. And now it's become ironic that they have done so much studying to pick apart the drawings of a bunch of five-year-olds. It's the equivalent of 10,000 years of archaeologists studying a modern kid's refrigerator painting of a dinosaur. The Cursed Tablet This new discovery of a mysterious cursed tablet could prove to be the key in learning once and for all who wrote the Bible and when? The folded lead tablet contains a written curse on the inside, and they discovered it in the Holy Land on Mount Ebal just a little while ago. Scientists have dated the tablet back to around 1200 BC and has the name Yahweh on it, which was the name for God given by the Hebrew people. What's interesting about the tablet is that it proves over 3,200 years ago, when the Israelites entered the Holy Land, they were already literate. 
It means they would have been able to document biblical events as they happened in real time. This is one of the most mysterious, unanswered questions about the Bible. Some people claim the Bible was written as things were happening, but historians believe it was written centuries later by people retelling versions of events. The discovery of this tablet, the first evidence of Hebrew writing before the alleged birth of Christ, means they could have written the Bible much earlier than previously thought. As for what's written on the tablet, it says, You have been cursed by the God Yahweh, and you will surely die. It's all very mysterious, and its implications are far-reaching. Just because there was Hebrew script 3,200 years ago doesn't mean they wrote the Bible as an ancient documentary. Hopefully, this scary ancient curse will help shed some light on the matter. New Saqqara Tombs Scientists have discovered a new collection of mysterious tombs in Saqqara, Egypt. They found approximately five ancient pharaonic tombs at the archaeological site, and it was revealed to the public in March 2022. The discovery is thanks to an Egyptian archaeological mission digging near the pyramid of King Merenre I. The tombs are from 4,000 years ago, each one decorated in immaculately preserved paintings. They also discovered other burials and interesting archaeological finds hidden deeper in the cemetery. What's pretty cool is that the archaeologists have been able to identify the people in every single tomb. This first tomb belonged to someone named Ari, a senior statesman. The next tomb belonged to the wife of somebody named Yaret. The third belonged to a priest called Pepi Nefani. Then we had a priestess of the goddess Hathor named Peti, and a man called Henu, who had several impressive titles. One of his titles was Overseer, another was Supervisor of the Royal House, and he was also Mayor and Hereditary Prince and Supervisor of the Orchard. It's unclear what exactly all of these titles mean, but you get the point. The Superquake 3,800 years ago, a devastating earthquake struck northern Chile and wreaked havoc on the coastal populations. According to a new study, the superquake was so devastating it took 1,000 years for the displaced coastal people to return to the shoreline. Just think about that for a second. The quake, which was probably around magnitude 9.5, decimated the coastline so effectively that it scared people from returning to the water's edge for 1,000 years. That may not seem like a long time, but in human history, it's a really long time. The superquake generated such a powerful tsunami that it hurled boulders hundreds of feet inland all the way to New Zealand, an entire ocean away from the center of the earthquake. They made the discovery thanks to physical evidence in Chile's Atacama Desert. Tsunami specialist James Goff with the University of New South Wales says he and his team found evidence of marine sediments extremely far inland, which would have only been possible via an earthquake and tsunami. The quake was almost definitely the result of the Nazca and South American tectonic plates rubbing together. It's the same thing that caused the 1960 Valdivia earthquake in Chile, the most powerful earthquake recorded in modern times. As for the whole human habitation thing, that comes from physical evidence as well. There are remains of human habitation dating back 3,800 years on the coastline, but there is a massive gap of a full millennium before they built any more settlements. Researchers believe the local population, at least those who survived, spread stories of the destruction. Then everyone stayed away for as long as those stories were being told. Ancient Sacred Pool on an island in Sicily, researchers have come across an ancient sacred pool that was once lined with mysterious temples and altars. The sacred pool reflected starlight from specific constellations, creating the perfect atmosphere for strange, mysterious pagan rituals over 2,500 years ago. It's interesting because until recently, they believed this pool to be an artificial harbor built by the military during the days of the ancient Phoenicians. But archaeologists recently did some excavations here, and they realized it has nothing to do with the military at all. It was actually a sanctuary, with the pool being the centerpiece of an enormous complex of temples and altars dedicated to different deities. It was the Phoenicians who built the pool in 550 BC as the heart of a new religious compound. This is according to Lorenzo Nigro from the Sapienza University of Rome. The religious complex is on a small island called Motia, off the western coast of Sicily. 
They inhabited it since the Bronze Age because of easy fishing and access to both fresh water and salt water. Then, in the 8th century BC, the Venetians showed up and started mingling with the locals. They brought their Phoenician culture to the island, absorbed the original island inhabitants into their own civilization, and in 100 years, the entire island had changed. It became a bustling port city with a vast trade network stretching across the Mediterranean. This brought the island into conflict with Carthage. In the 6th century, they destroyed Motia. Sumerian Riverboat In Iraq, archaeologists recently unearthed an ancient Sumerian riverboat. They discovered it in 2018 in the old city of Uruk. For those who don't know, Uruk was the first actual city in the world. It was originally founded in 5000 BC, when two smaller settlements merged, and it became the very first major metropolis. It was the birthplace of the first writing system and home of the legendary god-king Gilgamesh. 5,000 years ago, Uruk had a population of at least 40,000 residents. What made the city truly unique is that outside its main fortified walls, there were communities of farmers, manufacturing workshops, and suburbs sprawling off into the lands. But another cool fact about Uruk is that they filled it with a network of canals. One of the fundamental ways of getting around in the ancient city was by using riverboats. And that's where this new discovery comes in. They built the riverboat right around the time that Uruk declined, circa 2000 BC. Researchers discovered the boat under what is today a flat desert on the outskirts of the city. There is nothing even left to suggest it was once a neighborhood, or even that there had been water here. That's how dramatically the landscape has changed, swallowing the city and burying the river channels. Prehistoric Miami During the demolition of what was once a parking garage in Miami, Archaeologists came across prehistoric artifacts and ancient human remains. They originally built the parking garage in 1972 for the U.S. Custom House, but apparently nobody had realized they were building it over an archaeological site. Fast forward nearly 50 years, they demolished the parking garage with plans to put up three towers 82 stories tall and a baywalk. Swanky apartment buildings. Nobody expected to find actual Native American artifacts, never mind the remains of a Native American person. And yet archaeologists say this shouldn't come as a surprise. Because the construction project is at the mouth of the Miami River, people should expect there to be ancient remnants of something, either the bones of a settlement or the bones of buried people. The entire area around the mouth of the Miami River is one big archaeological zone. They should consider all of downtown Miami an archaeological zone, according to experts. The Tequesta culture once dominated the entire place, but they bulldozed and built over most of their history. We know little information about the remains that were found, and while archaeologists have put in a request to do additional digging before construction continues, we don't know if they've accepted their requests. A lot of money is riding on the buildings going up, so chances are we won't see too much more about additional archaeological finds here in the future. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below! And thanks for watching! Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time for more amazing discoveries! Bye!